courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Calgary Flames are back from China, and we are back for our seventh season of Fireside Chat. I'm Dan Stevenson, once again alongside Matt DeBorg, as we kick off the 2018-2019 season with our preseason episode. Matt, how you doing? Oh, very good. Looking forward to a lot of Flames hockey this season, and hopefully they have a better year than they did a year ago. You and I talked last during the rookie camp, and that was our last episode. And even when you look at the moves that have happened since then, this has been a busy team this summer. Well, it's been fairly good. Uh, I think that this has been the most active that the team has ever been. And after a season like last year, it's nice to see the general manager not resting on his laurels and taking the prerogative and initiative to change all of the things that he did to try and address all the various problems that the team seemed to have had. I think if he rests on his laurels, he'd be out of a job. I mean, everyone was disappointed. Management had to be disappointed by last season, and I think he really had to, and he said he has. He said, I've patched all the holes that we had. So we'll talk about if we think that's true later or not, but I think he's done a great job towards that so far. Yeah, uh, the Flames lack depth and anybody on the right side, frankly. And now the Flames have four high-quality lines, six, maybe seven high-quality defensemen, a pair of decent goaltenders, and a lot of skills up and down the lineup. So basically everything that the Flames need to be a good team is now in the organization. It's now on the players to actually perform. Where in past years, it's you could see that the team was all either partially rebuilding or other things got in the way, like the coaching staff last year and injuries and all of that. So, why don't we work our way from where we left off, sort of with the re signings, and work our way towards the preseason and training camp? What do you think? Yep. So let's talk about some of the re-signings. Probably the two biggest contracts the Flames gave out over the summer were Elias Lindholm, who got a six-year deal. He's getting paid $4.85 million per year. That makes him the fifth highest paid forward on this team. And he's behind Goudreau, Monaghan, Neil, Backlund, and then him. And Noah Hannafin got a six-year deal at $4.5 million per year, which makes him the second highest paid defenseman. What are your thoughts on those two deals? Uh, cheap frankly. Uh, both of the players have higher-end upside. Lindholm, I think that's more of even value for what he should be as a player. Where Hannafin, I think you're spending a little more for like year one and year two based on potential, but that could be a screamer of a deal in years three and on. Yeah, I agree. I think Lindholm, you're paying for the value now. It looks kind of expensive, but if you look at where he is, I mean, Froelich is is just behind him at 4.3, so I think those guys are pretty even, and Lindholm being the younger of the two, the contract makes sense. Yeah, you're looking at Lindholm basically being a second or third line forward that can chip in 40-ish points, and if he does that at 4.85, that's awesome. He's a good two-way player, excellent face-off guy, perfect. And I agree with you about Hannafin. You're you're overpaying him now, but I think by the time he's, what, 26 when that contract expires, 27, that's right in the peak of his career. If you look at when most defensemen get to their best hockey, so I think it'll be a steal of a deal by the end. Yeah, and it's one of those things that Calgary can afford that, and as the time goes on, those deals will get cheaper and cheaper just based on percentages of the cap. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at our defensive core, he's the only guy signed past 2021-22. Uh, and if, I mean, if he's our top defenseman at that point, making less than five, I think that might be the best, you know, top two deal in the league at that point. Yeah, especially if he develops where I think everybody's kind of expecting him to be, then, like, that'll be a bargain. And hopefully that comes to pass. Uh, we just have to wait and see, but... Especially from what we've seen of him in a Flames jersey, he looks like he has the potential to be a number one defenseman to take over from Giordano when he starts to decline. You'll have a player that could basically effectively swap spots with them. 
I think that's the key there. If you're looking at Noah Hannafin to be a number two this year, I think that might be a stretch. But he's 21. We're paying for the potential. And I think as he ages, as Brody ages, as, you know, Hamannick, they're Brody and Hamannick are both 28. Geo's 34. Those guys are all coming out of their best years generally. So I think Hannafin's going to be that young stud who we've locked up long term. And he will, yeah, he'll be the long term piece on this blue line. Mm -hmm. And you look at the guys that are also coming up, like Oliver Shillington has looked excellent at at both ends of the ice, a lot more composed overall, where there's always been questions of his defensive play. You have Rasmus Anderson, who's pushing for a spot in the NHL this season, Yusuf Valimaki, who's pushing for a spot, but probably won't just because of his age. So, you know, if you look at that, like if all three of those players hit, then you've got a solid top four of Hannafin and those three for the next decade. And yeah. that that's important, especially exactly. with guys transferring out. You can have a new group in for a long time. And it's weird to think about, but Gio's 34 now. I mean, you know, he's still a pretty reliable defenseman. He's signed till he's 37. But, you know, we got to start looking at winding Gio down as being our number one defenseman here. Oh, yeah. And there's probably going to be another year or two where he's a top tier guy. And then it'll start sliding where he becomes like a number three, number four guy. Sort of what like Brian Campbell was when he got to Chicago, where he wasn't needing to be the guy. And then slowly phasing him out of the lineup. The other big contract so far that we've signed is Mark Jankowski. We're all waiting for this one. A two year deal at one point six, seven, five million per year. I think this is another great deal. You've got, if you look at kind of comparables, we've got Bennett at 1.9 and we've got Zarnik at 1.25. So I think Bennett, two years, 1.67, and we still retain his RFA rights when that's done. That's a fantastic deal. Yeah, it's a, hey, good for you. You had 17 goals last year. Repeat it. it again. Yeah, repeat it twice, and we'll give you a big payday. Yep. And then a bunch of smaller deals here. I don't know if you have any comments on these, but I'll go through them. John Gillies re-signed two years at 750 per, and that's a two-way contract. David Riddick, one year at 800K per. Uh, Brett Kulak, one year at 900K per. And Garnet Hathaway at one year at 850K per. Uh, so the goalies, Riddick is likely going to be the backup to start the season. And Gillies, his, I believe, is a two-way this year and then a one-way yeah, next year. you're right. It's two-way so, this year because he's eligible to clear wa- to not have to clear waivers this year. Yeah, so I think what you'll end up seeing is Riddick getting the bulk of the backup duties while Gillies is on the farm in Stockton. And then depending on how everybody develops, you might, might see – Gillies be the starter and Riddick like a 50 30 split with those guys the following year or if they kind of have a bad year then maybe a veteran guy signed for another year like Smith re-upping for a year or something like that I think a lot of that will depend for next year how Parsons looks at the HL level as well yeah I agree and as for Kulak and Hathaway I think you're talking a 6-7 defenseman and the 13th forward. I was really impressed 13. we were able to get Kulak under a million because, yeah, I think yep. he'll be the number seven guy. Yep. And, you know, if Kulak stays in the lineup or he doesn't, I don't think it really matters too much to the organization. It, like, it, it depends on what Rasmus Anderson does, and frankly, I think that he's already stolen his spot. We'll see. Like, I don't see the stone uh, shifting out of the lineup just due to his contract but we'll, we'll talk see more about lineups when we get to the preseason but yeah i agree with you i think that kulak will be number seven yeah um there is one more signing of a new guy that we brought in and that was anthony peluso the flames signed this contract later in the summer peluso is a sixth round pick by the st louis blues in 2007 he's 29 years old and this is really your muscle signing i mean if you look at him he's a guy Tanner who, glass 2.0 pretty much um, I don't see Peluso getting an NHL job. I think he's muscle for the farm. What about you? It, he could be the 14th forward and stay in the NHL all year because he's sick getting paid the league minimum. Where, like, if you're playing a team like Edmonton or LA or Anaheim where they've got some dirt bags, then, you know, stick him in there. But I, I, I don't see him playing more than 20 games. 
It, See, I think that that role of sort of being the dirtbag cleaner upper is going to be Hathaway's. I think Hathaway's always played yeah. best when he's been allowed to be that guy. Yeah, I agree. So I think you send Peluso to Stockton, you let him, you know, patrol there, and if you need him, then you can call him up. No one's no. going to claim him. No, of course not. This is the next, um, oh, who is that enforcer guy that we got from Chicago years ago? Bullig. Bolig and McGratton. I mean, they're not great hockey players, but they're no. you know both Andre of them Waugh, uh, Yeah, uh, Eric Goddard, like all sorts of just filler guys I mean, that can if, fight for a year or two and then go away. Yeah, and I mean, if we look at Peluso's numbers last year in the AHL, he played 38 games in Hershey, seven goals, four assists for 11 points, and 34 penalty minutes. So, you know, for a guy who's really a fighter to get 11 points, that's not too bad. Yeah, usually we see some of these guys get like two points. Yeah, he's as far as like free agent guys that are of that type. He's actually one of the better ones. Like he's not Ryan Reeves or anything like that, but you know where he can actually play and do that. But we'll see. Uh, like I don't see him playing more than twenty or thirty games at best, and I I think it's going to be more like ten if that. Yeah, just looking at the roster, and again, we'll talk about kind of where we see the rosters later. I just don't see a spot for him starting here if Hathaway's here. I think it's yeah. one or the other. Um, I could see him getting called up later. And then we we're all waiting for a big trade to come this summer of some kind, and we got a trade. I wouldn't say it was a big one. The Flames sent Hunter Shinkarek out of town to Montreal in exchange for, or not, sorry, not to Montreal. Um, they send him out of town for Kirby Reichel. Yeah, well, Hunter Shinkarek has always been a player who's felt that he is better than he actually is. And, like, you see that sometimes. Like, that's part of the reason back when he was drafted that I didn't really want the Flames to select him because he had a bit of a bad attitude. And that was even evident just from his interviews on TV. And it's sort of like Dion Phaneuf, how he was really good and didn't really listen to the coaches to take that next step. And so Phaneuf kind of just stagnated. And with Shin Carrick, he just pretty much is the same player he was in juniors and hasn't really developed at all. My bad, and, it was a trade to Montreal. Yeah. And Kirby Reichel, he's all right. Uh, he's a decent scorer. He's just incredibly slow. And that's the only reason why he's not going to be a top six forward in the NHL. Because yeah, skill-wise, he could be. Yeah, I don't see this guy getting a, sh a spot this year unless he's, you know, an emergency call-up. But I think as far as AHL depth, if you look at his AHL numbers, he's a good AHL player. Yep. And sometimes you need good, high-quality AHL guys to help other players to develop. Because, like, having him with, say, Manjapane and Fu, like, that wouldn't hurt either of their development. Exactly. Have you seen this guy's AHL numbers? Yeah, she puts up pretty good numbers. Oh yeah, like he'd be a top six forward in the NHL if he could skate at all. It's just that he's exceptionally slow, and for how the NHL is now, he just can't do that. In 2016-2017 with the Marlies, he put up 52 points in 73 games. 2017-2018 with the Marlies, 30 points in 55 games. And last year, uh, 12 points in 16 games. So last year's almost a point-to-game player. That's the kind of guy that, yeah, I would keep on my HL lineup any day. Yep. And hopefully he can figure out some different method of skating. Like, even if he just becomes passable then he'd be a quality forward. It's just... Well, you and I have seen at the rookie camps that the Flames bring in skating coaches, so I think if anyone can work with them, these guys might be able to. Yeah. Penny he wants to learn. True. Which, that's not always the case, unfortunately. It's true. And then we have three big departures to talk about. Calgary Flames, they're no longer with us. Uh, the first one being Christopher Stieg, who I think we all knew his time in North America was over. He ended up signing the KHL. Matt Stajan went to Germany, and the Flames did what we've been waiting for for years. They bought out Troy Brower. Probably yeah. not a lot to talk about with those first two. What are your thoughts that Brower's finally gone? Well, I, I was disappointed, frankly, because I thought that he could have had a bounce back a bit this year. But unfortunately, uh, the Flames needed his cap space in order to sign Hannafin, and I think that's pretty much the only reason why he got bought out. 
uh, I, it's one of those things that is what it is, and hopefully he has a bounce back with Florida and earns another contract. Uh, it's always disappointing when you have a player that just doesn't fit and has, like, their career kind of go sideways when, you know, it's just a confluence of everything going sideways for everybody involved. So we are now on the hook for Troy Brower until the end of the 21-22 season, and we have a million and a half as a cap penalty for buying him out. So this year we have yeah. still Lance Boma, Ryan Murphy, and Troy Brower buyouts on the books, and then next year it's only Troy Brower. Yeah, that's why I was kind of hoping that we'd kind of just eat his contract for the year and then buy him out, but just to save like two years of you know, having to pay him for nothing, but it is what it is. I know what you're saying about, you know, keeping him around if and not having to buy him out, but I think it also sends a message to the team that, you know what, this guy was brought in. If you listen to what they said when they brought him in, they looked at him as potentially being a top-line right winger, and he fell that far that he was playing fourth-line minutes on the Brower play last year, and I, I think it's that message to players that, you know what, if you're not – doing what you need to be doing then we're gonna get rid of you yeah and that's you know accountability is everything and like the coaching staff last year massively underperformed the several of the players massively underperformed and they're all gone everybody yeah. that significantly underperformed is no longer a flame so that's a good thing mm -hmm. and while you're right we could have kept Brower around to be a fourth line guy i think it also says something when as an organization we say, you know, we're not paying you $4.5 million, we can find better, and we're willing to buy that out. That sends a message to everybody else. Yep. And it's a good kick in the pants to everybody else that, like, what happened last year is not acceptable, and get your butt in gear. Exactly. Well, with that, I think it's time to move on to the, to the preseason and the training camp. As we all know, the Flames started this year in China. Um, I'm not really sure what my thought what I think of those China games, they were, I was half asleep when I was watching them at the weird times that they were on. But I keep wondering, I mean, I understand why the NHL wants to go to China, but I have to wonder, could it be done earlier in the preseason? Could we send a squad to China right after the season's over or in mid July during world cup time? Like why do it in at this time of year when it messes everybody up? Well, it's good that the flames participated in it and We'll see. Uh, you know, like, I I understand why they're doing it, and, like, they're trying to get a bit of a foothold in the, the Chinese market, and that makes sense. Uh, but even then, if I'm, a, if I'm a China fan, why would I pay money to see the Calgary Flames play who didn't even make the playoffs? Like, if you want to do that, send your two teams who are in the Stanley Cup Finals or send an all-star team. But it's like, here's a mediocre team. Come watch us play great hockey. Yeah. It just, the, the squad's picked seems kind of odd to me. Yeah. Here's well, a crazy... Well, it's in Vancouver last year, so... Uh, well, and there's, and there's a whole bunch of teams going, you know, to Frankfurt and Germany and places that are hockey markets, and I sort of understand that. Yeah. Here's a crazy idea that I had, Matt. Tell me what you think. It, what if they were to move the All-Star game to the end of the season, sort of like the NFL does, and instead of... Having it in North America, what if every year the All-Star game was in a different foreign location? That'd be neat. So you've got your Frankfurt, your China. I'd have no problem with that. Like, after the Stanley Cup Finals, have the All-Star exhibition wherever. And, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. That way you can get that exposure. You're sending people that, you know, foreign fans would want to pay for. Yeah. So that was my that was my weird bugaboo with China. Is it just seemed like it really messed up the Flames preseason, and I I don't know that they've fully recovered from what that meant and not having enough practice time and all those things. Yeah, but well, on the life side of it, you know, I I think it was a very valuable experience for everybody. So oh like, for sure, I don't want to take away from it. I'm just wondering if there's a better time of year to do it. Yeah. Um, the one thing that did give us this year that we haven't normally seen at training camp is really two squads. We've always had like the rookie squad that did the Penticton tournament, but this year we had two distinct group A and group B squads. And I think it was interesting for fans to be able to go and see two, two very separate teams. You and I went to the Edmonton game and I commented to you, if you looked at it on paper, it was 
the Stockton Heat versus the Bakersfield Condors. Like it gave us a chance to really see some of these guys without, you know, James Neal and Goudreau and Monahan in the lineup and really get a better sense of Flames prospects. Yeah. And a few of them separated themselves out from the rest and like Dylan Dubé stood out. Um, David Riddick a little bit on the negative side in that particular game, but he's since bounced back. I, I yeah, it it's good to see. And like it, with games like that, you're wanting players to say, Hey, I'm the best damn player in this game. And like, they might not necessarily make the team, but you want them to make an impact to say, Hey, I'm in consideration at least. And some players didn't really play well and others did. And the ones that did have continued to do so. And that's a good thing. And that's a great point too. I think by having two separate squads, I mean, we were able to see guys like Dubé get featured in first line minutes where otherwise he may not have. And I think it was a better way for him to showcase himself when he's not trying to also compete with all the other guys, you know, the NHL guys who are there showcasing themselves. Yep. So you mentioned Dubé. Who else are you liking so far? Uh, the three defensemen, uh, Valimaki, Anderson, and Shillington. I agree. I th- but And I think all those guys, all three of them and Dubé are guys we expected to have a great offseason. They're all guys pushing for... Or who yeah, want to be pushing they all, for an All NHL three squad. of those defensemen look like NHL defensemen, if not sooner, later. I agree. And as for uh, the forwards, Fu, he looks like he could play eventually, but depth-wise, no. Same with Eat Bread. I think we have enough options now that, especially with some of the veteran guys that were signed, like Alan Klein, that you don't necessarily need to rush any of the kids up. I agree. Yeah, I, I think that there's, and we'll talk rosters in a bit, but I think that there's one uh, forward spot open, and I wouldn't be surprised if a kid gets that. But I liked what we saw from Mangiapani, but I don't think he's NHL ready yet. I think we saw that last year as well. He's looking good, but he needs a little more time. A number of people thought Fu would be ready, and I said last year about this time, I think he's a longer-term project. And I still think that. I think he's getting better. But on a deep team like this, you don't need to put Fu on the roster. No, like, there's about six players that if, like, Calgary was, say, Vancouver, that they'd be in the NHL. Mm -hmm. It's just that with the Flames having so much depth, you you don't need to push guys in. Yeah. I have liked what we've seen from Klimchuk so far. Again, a more mature guy, but I don't think he makes the NHL, but... I think it's going to be hard for the Flames to cut Dubé. Yeah, I think he's, especially with Dubé's versatility where he can play up and down the lineup, any of the three forward positions, and is generally just a smart player, I think that you could stick him on any line, in any spot, frankly, and he'd be fine. And I think he's done enough where he's earned a spot. Now, if you remember last year, the best kid at camp, hands down, was Jankowski. And we all said he's going to make the roster. And he didn't. He got sent to the HL for a variety of reasons. But I, I come back to with Dubé, yeah, he's earned his spot. But is it better to bring him into a lineup and put him in the bottom six? Or better to send him to the AHL and have him play, you know, top minutes? And that's one of those things where I think that this year, especially with having guys like Hathaway and Lazar at who can play a passable fourth line minutes that I think that it might be better for Dubé to start at least for the first month or so. And like say there any forward injury period, he's the first recall, but it's one of those that like, ideally you'd like to put him in there, but does it make the most sense? And I, I'm not quite sure, even though I think that like, if he played from day one, that that'd be fine. Yeah, I think that, I mean, like Jankowski, we saw him fight his way onto the team by being a call-up and making the team keep him last year. And I think that's what we're going to see with Dubé. I personally think Dubé should be sent to the HL to start. Let him, you know, show that he can tear up that league. And then, like you said, first call-up, bring him in and say, you know, make us not send you back down. I think we need that competition this year. And I think there's some guys that he could, if I look at a Quine or a Lazar or a Hathaway, you say to him, all right, these are your jobs to steal. 
Yep. And that that should be, frankly, the goal of anybody, whether it's Fu, Manjapane, Phillips, Klimchuk, all of them. It, you know, you have some guys that are borderline NHLers. Beat them. Period. Yeah. And... You know, it, I I just think Dubé will be given a chance to do that before those other guys you mentioned. Oh yeah, I agree, because <laughs> uh, I think frankly he's more skilled and talented overall and more ready than every one of the other ones. Yeah, I think that of those guys, Dubé is the one that could easily fit into a bottom six role a lot easier. I think if you look at a guy like Fu or Klimchuk, their games are really designed as what you'd want out of a top six guy. Mm-hmm. They're more finessey forwards. Yep. Um, but I think Dubé could bring some of that grit. Now, you were mentioning some of the some of the defensemen. To me, when I look at my rosters, I see Gio Brody, Hamilton, Hannafin, um, and Hamannick. So Gio Brody, Hanna, Hannafin, Hamannick, and Stone, sorry, as my top six, which leaves one spot open because I think Kulak will be number seven. There's three good young defensemen there in Anderson, Shillington, and Valamaki. My guess is that Anderson gets that spot. I think Shillington, there's no need to rush him, and he's he's still got some parts of his game, I think, that need to be worked on. What do you think? I agree entirely. I think Valimaki, he's probably the most skilled of the three just for raw talent, but he's also the youngest and could use a year or two in the A. Uh, Shillington, he's come a long, long, long way defensively where he could actually play on an NHL roster right now. But, frankly, I think Anderson is a little better overall right now, and I think that's who gets number six. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's not always a hint, but the fact that Raz was given a full number, number four, tells you that they're considering him as well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think Raz, and I also look at pairings. I think Raz, Rasmus Anderson and Michael Stone make a good bottom pairing there i think that shillington while he's come along a lot he didn't show it last year like raz did i think we all thought raz was ready midway through last year so i think you got to give the nod to raz because he was the first one ready and like we talked about with the forwards first time somebody goes down shillington comes up and you're probably also telling shillington look make us move stone yep exactly and there's always a market for defensemen and like if the flames want to trade stone I think there's about 20 teams that'd be knocking at the door. So yeah, and I mean the t- he's got a modified no trade. He's making 3.5, which is expensive for a for a bottom three guy. But I think that you need that veteran guy to help Raz. Yep, and eventually he'll be moved out, but no need to right now. Yeah, I feel kind of bad because Kulak went from being a number seven to being in the full time lineup and back out. But I just, I don't think if we look at those three young defensemen, I think that there's no way that he's going to be better than one of those guys to earn a top spot. You would hope that he'd have taken another step forward between like when he first started in the NHL to now, but he's still just kind of there. And I think that he'll just continue to be there and be that number six, seven type for his entire NHL career. Very replaceable as he stands now. He just has to, it, it, for him to have a longer term career, I think he needs to get better. And whether he has that in him or not is yet to be seen, but, uh, you know, time's a ticking. So now let me pose a different scenario on the blue line. If the coaching staff decides to go Stone Kulak as our bottom pairing, now I don't want Anderson anymore. I don't want him to sit no. in the press. Dalton box. Prout. Well, that's what I was going to say. If that happens, then you bring up Dalton Pro to be number seven. Yep, exactly. If they feel that Anderson's not ready, then bring the veteran guy in to be the number seven. Same and frankly, with, I, I wouldn't same even thing with be Dubé. You don't want the kids sitting in the press box. Yeah, and I, like frankly, I wouldn't even be disappointed if Prout was the number six, seven guy anyway. Because I, frankly, I think that he plays a little bit better of a game than Kulak right now. Yeah, I just don't think that you're going to... I don't think Kulak would necessarily clear waivers. And, and that would be fine. And Kulak's if that was also the case. 24 to approach 28. So I think you've kind of got to give Kulak the opportunity to stay with the upper team and see what he, he can do. I think he's got a better upside than Prout. Yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where either or. Like, if you lost Kulak, it would be like, oh, okay. Like, at the end of the day, like, it's not the end of the world if 
we lost him on waivers. It's not like uh, Paul no, Byron it, situation. I would, I would hate to see a 24-year-old leave here for nothing. True. And for those that don't remember, Dalton Prout came to the Flames last year in the Eddie Lack trade when we finally managed to find a buyer for Lack, send him to New Jersey, um, and played in Stockton all year. So that's the back end of the lineup and the front end and who we like. The next question on the flip side, who do you think is struggling right now in camp? Uh, not really anybody. That like James Neal is starting a little slowly. Lindholm's a little slow in terms of like you'd expect a little more from both of them, but it's not anything to be at all concerned about. Like a not, it's not like they are coming in like uh, Dutchin from uh, Tampa where he came in like seventy pounds overweight or something like that. So, and and I think if you're Lindholm and Neil, you also know you've got a job. And why mm-hmm. overexert yourself? I mean, you're there to warm up, but you don't need to bust your ass to keep your job. Yeah, well, it's just like Riddick in the first game against Edmonton. Like, yeah, he gave up seven goals, but uh, you could clearly see that he wasn't going full speed. to Because, you know, the last thing that you want to do is on the first game of training camp is to tweak something and then, oh, I'm out for two weeks or something exactly. like that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, you're right, and and I think Riddick too. I mean, they left him behind so that he could get a lot of good minutes here in Calgary, as opposed to taking him to uh, China and probably playing nothing. No. Yeah. So far, looking at the roster, I would say the biggest disappointment for me, or the guy I think is struggling, is Kulak because I expect him to turn it up a notch with all the young competition he's got coming in behind him. Uh-huh. I'm kind of disappointed to see he's not. And same thing with Lazar and Hathaway. I think that I was expecting them to sort of turn up their game a bit and show they should stay on this team, and I'm not seeing that from either guy so far. Well, I think Hathaway's been the better of the two. And I, I think agree. that if he's number 12, say, playing on with Bennett and Jankowski, that'd be fine. But, yeah, they're... It is, they're, they're fourth-line forwards. Like, you know, in the classical sense. Not anything to write home about there are guys that can just fill seven eight minutes and be fine yeah i guess i just looked at it that with as we were talking about earlier guys like peluso now who could take his job i kind of expect to see something different from yeah. Hathaway and maybe more of a one-dimensional game than we've seen in the past but we haven't seen that so far yeah well it's one of those things that i think that if either hathaway or lazar make the team that you might see like gaudreau double shifting or kachuk double shifting from time to time taking their spot so that way the other two can get a little bit of ice time with some someone better. I think that if Dubé makes the team, I think that he will take that spot. I also think that spot, let's just call it the fourth line wing spot just for the sake of argument, I think could have a lot of guys shifting out of there. I could see Hathaway, Quine, Lazar all shifting in and out of that spot. Uh-huh. Same here. And even guys like Dubé and Fu and Manjapani, if they have good seasons in Stockton. Yeah, in order to bring one of those guys up, though, one of the other guys would have to be moved out, either through waivers or trade. Yeah, well, if you're going to that point, I think that you'd be like, oh, okay, sure, fine, whatever. Yeah, I mean, if you need to, you wave Alan Quine. Yeah, right? or Hathaway or Lazar. Yeah. It, you know, if it comes to that, you're like, okay, well, you have a clearly better player. Mm-hmm. So yeah, why bother? For sure. Anybody you can see so far you think might lose their job, either in the NHL or get demoted further not down really. in the junior or in the double A, triple A ranks? No, nah, not really. I think everybody's pretty much in their set roles and ready to go. Yeah, the, uh, as we talked about, I think Kulak could lose his number six job to one yeah. of the kids. Um, and I could see a guy like Lazar eventually getting sent to the HL, but nobody, I think, comes out of the gate in a very different position than we expected. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think everything's more or less set in stone for now and wait for, like, the first month of the season and then maybe some adjustments. Any of the part-time tryout guys, and I'll read you their names, that you think might get a contract with Calgary either to stay here or to go to Stockton? So these players right now, and we brought in a ton of them just because we needed bodies before uh, the Flames went to China, and they've released some. But the guys that are left, Jeff Glass, the goaltender? I doubt it. 
I would hate to be brought in as a goaltender right now in Calgary's system, especially an older goalie. Yeah. Defenseman Ryan it. Sproul or Sproul. I could see him being a Stockton guy. Philip Samuelson, defenseman? Possibly, but I think that I'd go Sproul, Sproul's route instead. Yeah, I, I like better guys than Samuelson. Uh, yeah. Logan Shaw's here. To me, if you've got Peluso, you don't need Shaw. Again, it, possible for Stockton. He can play at the NHL level. He's just not very good. Well, then we don't want him here. Yeah. Um, defenseman Justin Falk. I could see that too. Like if they don't, if they want like a more defensive defenseman, then Falk's pretty good. The next two are the two defensemen I could see them signing, and that's uh, defenseman Duncan Siemens and defenseman Victor Svedberg. Yeah. It, it's one of those things, it just depends on what flavor of defenseman they, they want. Because all four of them play pretty different games from one another. And then there's also defenseman Andy O'Brien. So I think we can probably agree that two of them, maybe, will get signed. Yeah, two, maybe three. Two. It just depends on basically how much depth they want for Stockton. Especially yeah. on the blue line. Well, so I think you, two or three of those guys might, and the defensemen might end up getting signed. And if you look at the Flames' defensive depth, I mean, outside of the top three we talked about, there's really not a lot of prospect defensemen. So they're going to need to fill some roster spots down there. Yeah, and especially now that like they've filled the cupboard with small wingers and uh, some centers in the organization, I think that like the next few drafts it should be emphasis on defense. Well, that's it, and I think we all can even think of some forwards we're excited to see, but outside of the three we've talked about, I can't really think of any defensemen. I'm just looking at the list here, outside of Valimaki, Anderson, and Shillington. Yeah, it's are, kind of bland we've and We've got vanilla. Hogstrom. Yeah, like none of them are anything to get no. at all interested in. Olus Matson's kind of been a bust. Josh Healy's nothing to write home about. Yeah, like they're just there, frankly. So, so, yeah, I think we can definitely fill some spots in Stockton. Yeah, and especially with how the team is set up, I think that, like, with those three guys, they will eventually graduate, all three of them, to the NHL. I think they're all good enough to be NHL For sure, I don't think it happens this year, but eventually no, they'll all get No, but, there. like, eventually. And you'll need, like, a next group eventually coming in. So, like, over the next, like, two or three drafts, I I would not be surprised if a bunch of like top three round picks are used on D-men. Yeah, and even I mean, look at what the Flames did for a while when they were short on forwards, bringing in sort of you know everyone else's leftover prospects, and I can see them doing the same with Siemens and these kind of guys of saying, yeah, okay, you're a filler body until we figure out who's going to replace you. Yep. Next question for you so far: What are your thoughts on the coach Bill Peters? Like him a lot. I I think he's a massive upgrade on what we had. Although I frankly I thought Gullitson was the worst goal to, er, coach in franchise history. But you know, that's yeah. even worse than Glenn Gilbert. Yep, because at least the Flames that year were not expected to do anything. So <laughs> the that's one big the only difference. I'm, the one big difference I'm noticing is even just how he approaches the media. I mean, Gullitson was a very slick talker and. Um, it's sort of like in pro wrestling. If you've ever been a wrestling fan, you got the guys who can talk and the guys that just work, right? And the guys that are good in the ring. And I think Gullitson was that guy who, he was a good talker. I mean, you know, Hartley was kind of funny to listen to, but Gullitson was smooth in front of the camera. He could talk well. I think he made people buy into a lot of stuff because he was a good talker. And when well, I the thing Peter's is, that you look at Gullitson, and he was a coach with Vancouver, and... Tortorella and Mike Sullivan were with him in Vancouver and they all had the same system. So Tortorella goes to Columbus. Columbus has been one of the top teams in the NHL since he's been there. Sullivan wins a couple cups and could have won again last year had Washington not actually finally exercised their demons. And so you're you'd expect that with the other two guys basically being the same style of coach that it would have worked it's just that his personal beliefs on certain aspects of the game got in the way of the team actually manifesting properly and i think that 
getting rid of that and changing things up will help. Yeah, like I said, I don't think Peters, if you listen to him talk, he reminds me very much of a Daryl Sutter where he doesn't have a lot to say, but what he is saying is very hockey-focused. Yeah, and I was listening frankly, to him talk the team the other needs... day about naming the drills. Like, I don't care if the drills are named, but it's a big thing to him. Yeah, well, you sometimes, like, you just need no BS and just go do your effing job. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you need that, and after what happened last year you need someone to kick some butt and i think peters has that in him and i think that uh getting jeff ward will be instrumental in changing the flame season Uh, i think the power play is awesome and i think that we're gonna score a lot of goals and i would not be shocked if the flames have a top five power play this year for sure i think like that one that first goal by Zarnik in the last game, like that was just, that was one of the nicest goals I've ever seen the Flames score. So like if they Especially can do anything guys like so that, low in the lineup. yeah, like if they can do that even once in a while or even things like that, like that'll be a huge step up. One of the things I find interesting, you listen to Gullitson talk, and he talked about sort of what they were doing at practice and, you know, the X's and O's. And if you listen to Peters, he doesn't even want to do the X's and O's. He says that's a waste of time. He wants to make his practices much more efficient where he doesn't want to go to the board. So it's just it's a very different way of thinking hockey, and I think it's going to work out well for these guys. Yeah. Well, you also have to figure that guys like, say, Gaudreau and Monaghan, like, they know what they're doing. And... Like, even guys like, say, Garnett Hathaway, he knows how to play the game. You, The Flames have a lot of smart players in their organization. So, like, you don't really need to hammer down excessively on how things are done. Like, they know what they're doing. It's, it's like, say, like with Hathaway last year, one of the reasons why he struggled was he wasn't allowed to hit. Well, that was the only reason why he was effective as a player in Stockton so it's stuff like that like if you can just let them do what they do I think that will help them perform better overall for sure you gotta you gotta help them do what they do better but you have to know what each player's personality is they still need coaching they need oh yeah for sure this up clean that up but you've gotta let each guy sort of you need to have different identities on your team yeah Exactly, and it's sort of like what Hartley used to do, where he'd let the players dictate things a bit in terms of, this is how I play, so I'm going to play this way. And the coaches worked around that to get everybody to work together, even though they were kind of on their own page. They built a system to match the players, not tell the players to confine to a system. Mm Mm-hmm. You need a bit of both, but I think that uh, the the flexibility that Peters is showing is a lot better than the hard rigidity of Gullitson. I agree. Um, so looking at that, looking at everything we've talked about so far, is we're, what, one week, pretty much a week away from by the time this comes out, the NHL season starting. What holes do you still see in the Flames lineup? Is there anything you think that they still need to work on? Well, uh, fourth line right wing could, you know possibly use Dubé but, but even that's then not, that, pl- that piece is in the system yeah uh the goaltending I think is going to be the main question for the season like can Smith be healthy can Smith play at the level that he normally does how do Reddick and Gillies play how do Parsons play it that's uh, the main problems but I don't see any of them being a major obstacle because the Flames could always just go trade for a goalie or something during the season if need be. Well, here's a crazy idea I posed to you last time we talked is I think a big part of Gillies and Riddick and the disappointment there was they were asked to take on NHL starter minutes when Smith got hurt. And while I think they're both good goalies, I don't think either one is ready for NHL starter minutes. If you look at what that means in, you know, a two-week schedule, that's a lot of NHL hockey. Yeah, and I don't think they are either. And they have to learn how to do that. And And they got thrust into it too early. Yeah, and I think that it it was a combination of, like, I think the 
players to an extent kind of gave up on the season a bit overall and like injuries happened and like it was like basically the whole all the wheels fell off the train all at the same time and i think that like you can blame the goalies but i think that like the defense was partially responsible the forwards were responsible partially like it was just kind of everything went wrong at the same time and I think the goalies kind of got overwhelmed, and it just everything screwed up all at the same time. But if Smitty gets hurt again, I think the goalies will get overwhelmed again. And like you mentioned, the Flames could trade for somebody, but goalies generally cost a pretty penny because there's only so many of them. So I was looking around thinking, what could we do with the backup job? And I was thinking to myself, hmm, I don't want to make a trade. I wonder who's still a free agent because there's still goalies out there that are Decent goalies who need a job who aren't playing. So here's two names that I thought uh, that might be a capable backup. I'll kind of defend each one, and then I'll get your thoughts. The first one who I know is not going to be popular with fans is Kerry Lettinen, still looking for a job. Yeah, he fell out of favor in Dallas, but even if you look last year, he played 37 games as a guy who could come in here, potentially play backup minutes, but knows how to be an NHL starter. If Smith goes down, he's proven that he can play those starter minutes for a month, two months, whatever. The other guy who's uh, younger, but again, has shown he could probably play starter minutes for a month, two months, would be Steve Mason, who's also looking for a job. He played uh, 13 games in Winnipeg last year, 58 games in Philly the month, the year before. So another guy who's proven he could play starter minutes. And I bet you get either one of those guys for less than $2.5 million. Yeah. Um, it, I'd let the rest of the goalies play out the preseason and then evaluate because I still think it's a little too early because both Riddick and Gillies have played well at times this preseason. So, I you know, if, say, like, Riddick uh, gave up, like, four or five, six goals in his second start, then I'd be a little more concerned. But I think that he'll be fine, frankly. I think he'll be fine as a backup, don't get me wrong. But my worry is, again, if he has to cover full-time NHL starter minutes if Smitty goes down, yeah. now what? I know. I think, and that's, and that's a- why I think that either one of those those veteran starters, yeah, they're a great backup, but they could also, we know that we'd have more faith in them. Yeah. Well, P- Peter Budai's available, isn't he? <laughs> of those three, I'd still rather go those guys. Yeah. It, Actually, my preference was Andre Pavlik, but it looks like he's retired. Yeah. So I know that Lettinen's not a popular choice, but to me, if you're building a good roster, you got to make sure you got have good goaltending too. And again, I think Riddick would be fine as a as a backup. And if we had a goaltender like Kipper who was durable, who made it through everything, yeah, I'd say bring Riddick in. Yeah. But we know that Smitty has some injury problems, and I think even having one of those guys – in the organization signed, even if they were sent to Stockton, just that they're there. So if there's an injury, you can pull them back up because they're both guys that we know can shoulder that starter load. Yeah. It, there's no real right or wrong answer, really, at this point because uh, there's just not enough information on how Gillies and Riddick are doing. And if they're, they struggle, I think that a signing of a veteran would be more likely if they play well, then I think that there wouldn't be as much of a need. The only issue you get if you do sign a veteran is now you've got a three-headed monster in Stockton with Riddick, Gillies, and Parsons. Yeah. Because you've got two other guys, McDonald and Schneider, who are going to go to Kansas City. So you would need to find a place for one of your other for one of your goalies to play, whether that's through trade, whether that's through loan. But you're not going to want to keep three developing goalies. Yeah, that's why I'd be more likely to keep things as they are and let's just basically hope that Smith doesn't break down. Yeah, I guess, and, and I and I agree. I don't necessarily want to go out and get a, a veteran goaltender. I don't think it's the right move on paper because we do need to develop a young guy. But at the same time, if we don't do it now, it's going to cost a lot to acquire yeah. that piece down the road. And I almost look at, do we do it as an insurance policy? And uh, just like we were talking about with the forwards and defensemen. Guys, we've got Steve Mason. We've got, you know, uh, Kerry Lettinen. Make us send them to the A. Yeah. You know, like Gillies, show us you can do this. And I think even if you had Gillies here as your number two, 
um, to play those games when you need him or call him up once in a while to play those games. But even if he looks good in the preseason, I don't have the confidence in him to play, let's say, three weeks of starter minutes. No, and I think that if Smith goes down, that you'll see like both of the other guys splitting time evenly. Like I, I think it would be basically you play a game, you play a game, you play a game, you play a game, back <laughs> and forth, and until one of them takes the spot. Yeah, it could be, and that's a tough place to put them in too. Yep, yeah, but you know, sink or swim. You know, or like play till you lose system. Yeah, something along those lines. I well, guess I'm also looking in the playoffs of, okay, let's say in the playoffs, worst comes to worst and Smitty goes down. I don't have confidence that we get any headway with Gillies and Riddick in net. I know. And I, if that was the case, I'd actually go with door number three and actually have Tyler Parsons start. But that's... See, I don't want to start a kid in the playoffs. And then that's a lot of pressure for yeah. a new NHLer. I agree. But, you know, I, it worked with Matt Murray. It's worked in the past with several other goalies, so... We'll see. Those are far better teams, too, they're in front of. True. I think that, and again, looking at it from the playoff vantage point, I think Mason and or um, Lettinen, again, we know are proven guys, and I would feel much better. I wouldn't feel totally confident, but I'd feel much better going into a playoff run with a veteran guy there. Yeah. And one I thing mean, that I don't understand is how no team claimed Oscar Dansk the other day. Like, Ottawa and Edmonton could use some goaltenders in their organization. Why didn't they claim him? Doesn't make any well, sense I mean, to me. It kind of tells you something about him. I mean, he was given up to go to Vegas in the expansion draft, I believe. Nobody wants him. There's got to be something in this that... I, I don't know. know. There's got to be something to him. Yeah. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, because on the surface, like he looks like a decent goalie from when I've seen him play, and... Like, even back when he was in juniors and all that, like, and before he was drafted. So, like, a, it's just a little confusing. But, he had a long yeah. injury, though, last year, didn't he? Hmm? He was yeah, out yeah. for a while last year. So maybe yeah. teams want to see if he'll rebound first. Yeah. You just think that with teams that are rebuilding that and don't have any goaltender depth at all in their organization that you'd figure that they'd take a flyer on him. But, yeah, it is what it is. Well, and I can see a team like Edmonton going out and signing a Steve Mason or a Kerry Lettinen still as well. Yeah, same here. Those guys haven't gone to um, Europe, so I can definitely see one. Yeah, well, I think that guys. both of those guys are like, hey, we can go sign with Edmonton tomorrow. Please, somebody else give us a job. Anyone, well, anyone, and, please. And, and so <laughs> going back to the idea of those guys in the Flames, I mean, I think, tell me what you think. I think if you're the Flames and you signed either one of them, you could get them through waivers if you wanted to. Oh, yeah. So and, even, oh, and if you, even if they got claimed, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But even if you said, okay, we want Riddick to be the backup, but we want to have one of them on call in case we need them, I think that would not be a bad idea. And it also then gives Gillies a good veteran partner in the AHL. Yeah. It just depends yeah. on their attitude, because I think both of them, the reason why they haven't signed is that they feel that they're NHL goalies and are waiting for a job to open up, which I don't okay. blame them. They're both no, very good either. goalies. It's just, yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I haven't heard anybody talk about those two names, and that was just something I came up with the other day. Of hmm, Instead of, you know, we're all talking about what could we give up for a goalie, and why give some up if we can bring in a serviceable goaltender and ha for no return? So yeah. I think that might still be the move you see the Flames make. Yep. So um, last thing about the preseason is rosters. Where, what are you kind of thinking for the Flames roster going into the season? We can talk a little bit more next week as final cuts are made, but is there anything? I, I mean, if we, I'm going to just read out the lines that I think will be sure. for at least a bit and sure. go from why there. don't you do your forward lines and i'll do my forward lines and then we'll move to the blue line yeah i think gaudreau monahan and lindholm will be line one um line two uh, will i think will be kachuk backland and zarnik uh line three will be frolik ryan and james neal and the fourth line, Bennett, Jankowski, and Dubé, Lazar, Hathaway, whomever. Interesting. That really pushes some of the big money contracts down the lineup. 
Yeah, and I I think that you could switch Neil onto the first line and have Lindholm center the third line and move Ryan over to the right wing on the third line. That would also feasibly work. So here's what I'm thinking on the on the front end. I think you're going to have the first line of Goudreau, Monahan, Lindholm. Because Lindholm can be a centerman, and they don't want Monaghan taking faceoffs after his wrist surgery, so then that makes sense. I think you'll see line two start as Kachuk, Backlund, Neal. I think that you'll see James Neal with the money that they're paying him go on that line. I also think they're looking at him as a great setup guy for Kachuk. I uh-huh. think Neal will jump to the first line on the PP though. I think the first line PP will be Goudreau, Monaghan, Neal. I can see the team starting the year with a third line of Janko, Bennett, and Froelich. I think that part of Janko and Bennett's problem last year was they didn't have a good number three. It was supposed to be Yager, and it wasn't, and he was in and out. So I think if you can put Froelich there, with what we've seen from Froelich defensively, I think he could really help those kids by letting them be the offensive guys. He can go in, dig the puck out, get it up to them. I think that could work well. And then I think Ryan, Zarnik, and... I'll just call it Hathaway, becomes the third line. And I think that the extra forwards are Lazar and Quine. Yeah. uh, That's the thing. It's a good thing that Peters is the coach because he likes to put everything in the blender. And I think we could come up with like 20 different iterations of our lines. And I think that that could conceivably work. Well, that's great too, because when we do have an injury... Right, it means that we still got strong lineups. I mean, if let's say Lindholm goes down, everybody shifts up one. It's still a great line. Yep. What I do think this means long term, and we'll talk more about it next week. But I think Froelich is a number three right winger, might make him expendable in the long term. I agree. Um, so let's look at the back end. What do you have for your pairings? Geo Brody, obviously. Hamannik, Hannafin, obviously, and then Anderson and Stone with uh kulak or prout depends on what they feel like basically yeah i have the same as you i geo brody is the number one pairing hamannick hannafin is number two um and stone and anderson i have as my number three pairing with kulak as the extra and then in net i've got smith riddick yep same i think riddick has to be the backup just because Gilly's got one year left of waiver eligibility, or before he's waiver eligible. You want to use that. You want to send him to the A and let him play that out. Yep. That pretty much covers to where we are today. The Flames are playing a couple games. Tonight they have the split squad playing, and that's against uh, the Jets. And that game is still going on as. Oh, that game's. Yeah, still going on as we're talking. It's 4 2 Jets. And tomorrow, the what's expected to be the big squad against San Jose. So we'll see how those go. But not a lot of other hockey to talk about. So let's talk a couple other things about the Flames. First is the new third jersey. I guess new or old, depending on how you want to look at it. They brought back the 80s, what we now call the retro jersey is the third. I'll start with this one. I'm a little disappointed. I think a third jersey is designed to get people to buy jerseys. And why would I buy this again when I think everyone's got one and you can go get the previous third Jersey for like 60 bucks at Jersey city. I don't think they're going to sell a lot of these. There's no change to it. I was kind of hoping I always hated the Calgary script Jersey, but I was hoping something like that. That was new and different with a different striping pattern. Um, I don't know what you think. I'm just kind of disappointed. They just relied on that again. If they would have made the retros, the regular jerseys, that would have been great. You gotta wait for it, a new arena for that, my friend. But you know, it's just bland vanilla. It's like, okay, yeah, that's great. People like that jersey, but okay, yeah, you know, like you could have done something more interesting, I think. And like, one thing that's always kind of irked me with the Flames is that their steadfastness with the same shade of red, especially with third jerseys. Like they they could go darker possibly and like they did with the heritage classic jersey i'm not saying use that red but like there, there's plenty of different options available to make things spice it up and go a different route while keeping the same concept and i think that like the especially the regular jerseys i think are 
terrible. I think the regular Flames jerseys are the worst in the NHL. But um, I wish instead of going retro for the home and away, because I mean, I would like to see that, but I don't think they would, is taking the old script jersey with the striping patterns on those, fix up the shoulders a bit, and that would have made a nice home and away. Yeah, that would have been a major improvement as well. Without it, the script. Yeah, on the like throw the black C on it and you're good to go. What I would like to see from the Flames is do something with the retro colors, but a new take on it. Like take the black out. They seem to like the white C and all that on the third. But could we do something different with the striping to make it new and unique and say it's you know retro inspired? Yeah, sort of like the new Jets third jersey, which is retro inspired, even though it has no real connection to the team. Yeah, like or, it does, but it doesn't. Like it, it the script logo is similar to the writing that they had on their original WHA jerseys, and it has a retro feel to it, even though it doesn't. Yeah, I mean they they tried that with the Heritage Classic, and to me they really bungled that one. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't like script. I want our jersey to have a flaming C on the front. To me, that's the important piece of, you know, the Flames logo that we need there. But, yeah, what if we did a different striping pattern for the retro colors? Or, you know, go like, with... Like, there's something that they could have done differently. Like, it's it seemed kind of like a cop-out, like, it, easy. Like, yeah, the fans will like it because they like the jersey, but... You know, like, there's not no innovation there. It's just like, well, oh, if, well, this... And if you think the fans like the jersey, why not go with the Stockton Heat black template? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's like Nintendo releasing the, the classic mini game thing. And, like, yeah, people like that, but you're not innovating at all. And... But the difference there is it's been a while since they've had that, right? Like, yeah. they're re-releasing their Nintendo after 20-some years. We just had this jersey, what, two years ago. Like, everyone owns one who wants one. Yeah, exactly. So if, if the whole point of a third jersey is to get people to buy one, no one's going to go buy this new jersey. Exactly. If our listeners haven't seen it, you should uh, Google for Stockton Heat Black. They have the Flames template with a black jersey. And I'm not a huge fan of the Flames wearing a black jersey. I like the red. But if you want them to buy something different and you think the fans like the template, get the black jersey. Yeah. At least people would buy it. Well, let's talk about one last thing here, and we'll wrap it up for this week. Um, last one is F Flames owner Clay Riddell passed away September 15th at the age of 81. He's one of the newest Flames owners. He joined the team in twenty or in 2003, and he's known as one of the nicest guys out there. Anyone who's met him has nothing but great things to say about him. An unabashed fan of the game and of the Flames. Um, he fully understood the importance of the Flames in the city as both the emotional fabric of history and as what it is. I mean, it's they donate a lot of money and do a lot of charity work. So we want to send our thoughts out to the Riddell family and uh, wish everyone who knew Clay um, peace at this time. And, you know, Clay, is, it's, it's tough to lose somebody who's that important to the community. I agree wholeheartedly. And it's always disappointing to lose somebody that important. Well, Matt, I think that about does it for this episode. Anything else you want to touch on? Just looking forward to some more hockey and getting ready for the regular season. We'll wrap this up, and we'll be back next week with our regular season previews. So stay tuned for that. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.